policy making Thank it you, deserves. Senator MacDonald. Your time has expired. <clears throat> we'll now move to question time, and I call Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Yesterday in question time, when pressured on how many passengers have walked through sanitised foot mats, the minister said, and I quote, 100 per cent of passengers have been walking through sanitised foot mats. The minister has clearly misled the Senate. In fact, tens of thousands of passengers have disembarked from Bali since the outbreak in Bali on uh, July 5 Order. and the installation of the foot mats only this week without uh, footwear being disinfected. I wrote to the minister informing him of this misleading statement yesterday and he still has not taken the opportunity to correct the record and make a ministerial explanation to the Senate. When will Order. the minister do the honourable thing and correct the record to the Senate? Uh, Senator Watt, uh, Minister, sit down. Before I call uh, the minister, I am going to ask that you respect the senator asking the questions and not interject, and that you listen to the minister's response. Minister. Thank you, President. Well, that's a pretty sad way for this question time to start out today, given that I think on three or four occasions yesterday I actually answered the question that you are asking. I have received, I have received a letter from you, which I have Senator signed a response McGrath. to, and I'm sure that you, will, you may have even received it by now. Uh, well, maybe talk to your office, but we certainly have, have signed off a response. Um, and I will confirm yet again, I'm probably up to five times, six times, seven times, that 100 per cent of passengers who have returned to Australia from Indonesia since the foot mats were in place on Monday and Tuesday. That's what I said. That's what I said. Order. Wow. Wow. Order. Is this what you've become? Is this what you've Minister. become? Is this what you've become? Minister, resume your seat. Order. Senator is Order. 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 Uh, Senator Birmingham. Senator Ayres, I had just called the Senate to order and you interjected. I would appreciate you following my order when I call for order that you do not interject. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you, uh, President. It is rather interesting that only since the election and they went into opposition that the opposition became interested in footmats because, of course, this outbreak reached Indonesia on the 9th of May. What did the opposition do about footmats or biosecurity zones or any of the things that we've done in response to the outbreak? Well, I'll tell you what they did. The former minister, Mr Little Proud, uh, when the outbreak oh, reached— sorry. Uh, oh, uh, come Senator, on. Senator, what, uh, minister, resume your seat. Uh, Senator Brockman. It's relevance. And I'll oh, come on, Senator Watt. Answer the question. Do not attack uh, the opposition. Brockman. Senator Brockman, just a moment, please. I'm not quite clear what your point of order was. Can you order. go directly? Yeah. I'll, I apologise. I apologise for responding to Senator Watt's interjection. However, uh, I was making a point of order on direct relevance. This is not an opportunity to attack the opposition or thank previous you, Senator government Brockman. policy. Resume your seat. Order. 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 Senator Wong and Minister Watt. Minister Wong. The question was about uh, foot mats. The minister was directly um, referring to foot mats. As you know, I cannot, uh, Minister Watt, I haven't called you that I cannot direct a minister on how to answer a question, but he is being directly relevant to the question, which was about foot mats. Senator, uh, minister. <laughs> Order. Senator McGrath, let's allow the minister to continue the answer. 
Minister. As I was saying, I'm pleased that the opposition has become interested in foot mats because when this outbreak reached Indonesia on the 9th of May, what did the former Minister for Agriculture, Mr Little Proud, do? Did he introduce foot mats? No. Did he introduce biosecurity zones? response zones? No. You know what he did? He sent a tweet. He sent a tweet. That is the only thing Minister Little Proud did at the time. And then he didn't say anything until the 6th uh, of July. What? Senator McKenzie. Madam President, this is actually a grave matter that this minister uh, on Senator the first McKenzie, day has your my point question of order? direct relevance. Thank you. This minister Thank you. has misled the uh, Senate Sen and is not Senator dealing McKenzie, with it in his question. Please resume your seat. Minister Watt, you, the, there was a direct question about mats. I was giving you some latitude, but please get to the, um, the directness of the question, please. Thank you, President. I have lost count of the number of times I have now answered this question. I did it repeatedly yesterday, again today, Senator and McGrath. in the letter today. Uh, Minister, former Minister Littleproud was not the only person to say nothing about foot mats or the outbreak until uh, it Senator got to Bali. McGrath. We heard nothing from Senator McKenzie until the July of the 19th. Uh, she didn't you, comment Minister, once when it got to Indonesia. Senator McKenzie, a sec our first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I refer Senator Watt to his statement to the Senate yesterday that Australia has, and I quote, approximately one million vaccines available to us in a stockpile and they are available within one week's notice, end quote. Given this fact, why won't vaccines be delivered to Indonesia, who's going through an uncontrollable outbreak, for more than four weeks? as uh, first advice and not arriving till August, as you informed the Senate. Um, Minister Wong. Just on a point of order, I, I'd ask you to rule as to whether that's in fact supplementary to the primary question. Um, if the minister wishes to answer, obviously it's a matter for him, at his, yeah, but uh, that is not in my submission uh, as su supplementary to the primary question. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Uh, President, on the point of order, both the question and the supplementary question relate to the foot and mouth disease outbreak in Indonesia. Both of them relate to quest answers given by Senator Watt in question time yesterday on the same related issue. It is demonstrably a, a supplementary question to the primary question, and you should rule Senator Wong's point of order out of order. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'll take some advice. Uh, thank you. Given there's been uh, different views expressed by Minister Wong and Senator Birmingham, we think that um, I'm advised that the question is broad enough to allow that first supplementary. Um, but I will review the Hansard and, if necessary, come back to, uh, to the Senate with an answer. But I would uh, invite the Minister to respond. Uh, thank you, President. I'm happy to take the question. Uh, it seems that the opposition... Uh, Senator McGrath. Minister. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Senator Brockman. President, I mean, direct relevance. The minister cannot start an answer with the opposition. I mean, that is uh, a, Senator that Brockman, is a significant. Senator Brockman. That Senator Brockman, I've asked you to resume your seat. Senator Brockman, I have asked you to resume your seat. Thank you. Order. The Senator has just commenced his answer, um, so we will see where he goes in the next breath. He's barely said two words. Minister. Thank you, President. As I was saying, uh, we have ordered vaccines for Australia, and we have them in the vaccine bank to ensure that we are properly prepared for a foot and mouth disease outbreak should it reach Australia. The, uh, the former minister's question goes to Senator Indonesia McGrath. vaccines. 
Now, I know this might come as a surprise to the opposition because it's something they never practised when they were in government, but when you work with other countries, you need to do it cooperatively. You actually need to develop a partnership relationship as opposed to the kind of relationship your government cultivated with our friends in Southeast Order. Asia and the Pacific. So, when the Prime Minister was in Indonesia, where he was very well received, I might point out, uh, he offered assistance in the form of vaccines to uh, the, the Indonesian government. At that point in time, they decided to pursue their own interests. We have since, as Thank a result you, of my Minister, visit, offered a million and they're expired. coming. Senator McKenzie, a second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, biosecurity officers will not only be deployed into airports, they will be deployed into mail centres as well. How many of the 18 new biosecurity officers are currently operational at mail centres? Which mail centres are they? And what is their specific foot and mouth disease passenger intervention task? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. I anticipated I might get a question about this because it came up yesterday. Would you like the answer? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Please continue to answer the question, um, Minister the, And My intention, as is normal uh, practice, is to answer the questions that I took on notice yesterday at the end of question time today, which is what many ministers on your side of the uh, chamber have done. The, the answer McGrath. is uh, that my announcement was that our new funding, funding that your government, when you were in power, did not commit and did not implement, will deliver 18 new biosecurity officers. They are currently being recruited. And in the meantime, we have employed 65 contractors and 10 other officers in the Order. meantime. Now, Order. again, I make the point that every Order. action we have taken, sanitation foot mats, uh, biosecurity response zones, extra bus uh, biosecurity Watt. officers, none of those measures were ever taken by your government when this Minister outbreak Watt. got to Indonesia. All Minister you did was send Watt. tweets. Resume your seat. Senator McGrath, I have asked politely on a number of occasions that you not interject. Please desist with the interjections. They are disorderly. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, and it's no wonder, uh, with, when this, with this calibre of debate, that industry Minister is Watt. backing the government. Uh, thank you. The time has expired. Senator McGrath, I asked you just then, I directed you not to interject, and the minute the minister got up, you interjected again. Uh, uh, I'm not. It's not a debate. Senator McGrath, it is not a debate with me. It's a direct request. I'm asking you to stop being disorderly. Yes. Uh, minister Wong. Uh, if I may... Um President, uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, re in relation to your previous point of order, uh, perhaps refer you to um, uh, Odgers uh, and ask, uh, and I do this also so that the opposition can be aware of the position of the government. In relation to the use of supplementary questions, President McClellan made a statement in which he said, uh, supplementary questions are appropriate only for the purposes of elucidating information arising from the original question and answer. They are not appropriate for the purpose of introducing additional or new material or proposing a new question, even though such a question might be related to the subject matter of the original question. So I, I, I again, whilst I do note there's been some changes in standing order since that time, I, I would ask you, uh, perhaps subsequent to question time, to consider that. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. And, and President, uh, whilst undertaking that review, I would encourage you uh, to look back at uh, past consideration of questions that were asked. Uh, I think you will find that in terms of uh, the relationship between the question that is asked and the supplementary questions, uh, that oftentimes that relationship uh, relates very specifically to the subject matter and the flow of then smaller issues uh, related to, uh, to uh, those subjects. Uh, in this case, uh, the discussion of foot mats uh, and the discussion of vaccines being supplied to Indonesia clearly all relate to the foot and mouth outbreak uh, and are following the very common practice since the process of having the primary question and two supplementary questions uh, was introduced into this Senate. Thank you. and I thank both uh, leaders for that 
uh, those comments. And uh, as I said, I'll review the Hansard and come back to the Senate if necessary. Senator McKim. Yes, if I could just on a point of order very briefly observe, um, President, that we're chewing up a lot of time at the moment. <laughs> Question time yesterday uh, had a very, very small number of questions asked because time was consumed with excessive points of order. I just simply uh, ask senators, uh, including Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham, to consider the passage of time while they are making their points of order. Uh, Senator Kim, I can reassure you that during this current uh, debate and points of order, the clock has been stopped. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I think we're calling Senator Green. Senator Green. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. <clears throat> Can the Minister advise the Senate on the state of the economy following the Treasurer's economic statement today? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I thank Senator Green uh, for her interest in uh, the economic um, situation across Australia and the Treasurer's ministerial uh, statement that he made earlier today. Uh, it's, it's true that we're facing a very challenging set of economic circumstances, both domestically and internationally. And the Treasurer, in his address to the House of Representatives today, delivered that message, but also importantly, that the Australian economy is growing, but there are some challenges that need to, to be managed uh, in the near term. We've been upfront with Australians about that since coming to government, and we will continue to be upfront and honest as new challenges emerge. Today, in the latest update of Treasury forecasts, the Treasurer outlined that economic growth has been revised down by half a percentage point for the next uh, three years, I think. Inflation is ex expected to peak at seven and three quarter per cent by the end of the year, and that the inflation challenge obviously has an impact on the outlook uh, for real wages and real wages growth. The forecasts also show with inflation, with real wages, it will get worse before it gets better, but that it will get better. The current expectation is that inflation will ne indeed get worse this year, moderate next year, and normalise the year after. The Treasury forecasts also show that real wages are expected to stabilise mid next year before growing again in 23-24. When it comes to the budget, Speaker, whilst the final results for the 21-22 financial year are likely to show an improved, um, than in, a better in, than improved expected outcome compared to what was released at PFO. However, temporary factors like supply chain disruptions, capacity constraints and extreme weather have delayed some spending and low unemployment and volatile commodity prices boosted revenue. The short, medium and longer term pressures on the Thank budget you, Senator are Gallagher. more pronounced. Your time has expired. Senator Green, first supplementary. Oh. Thank you, President. Can the minister advise how the challenges in the economy are impacting Australians? Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I thank Senator Green. And this was, uh, we absolutely understand the impact uh, that this is having on Australian and Australian households, and it's why we're being really upfront with the Australian public, because Australians are up for that. They want honest government. They, want, they don't want a government of spin and of pretending things are, are fine when they're not. They want a government that understands the challenges they're facing, that, that, that household budgets are stretched, that bills are going up, that wages aren't matching that. They've had 10 years of stagnant wages growth at, at best. They've had nine years of a government with missed opportunities and wrong priorities. And this government is going to be clear about what the challenges are and clear about the plan to manage those challenges and to help households deal with that. But we're not going to pretend that nine years of neglect and poor government can be reversed Thank you, Senator overnight. Senator Gallagher, your time has expired. Order. Order. I've called Senator Green. Second supplementary. Thank you, Senator Green. Thank, thank you, President. What are the government's plans to deal with these challenges? Senator Gallagher. Thank you, um, Speaker. And Senator I, Smith. I, I, I know responding to interjections is disorderly, but from it the is. interjections I have managed to hear whilst I've been talking, they will be interested in the answer to this ca uh, question. Despite what some of them, uh, the op those opposites say, we do have a plan to deal with the economic challenges we face. 
and one of the plan is to deal with the waste Order. and rorts that you Senator riddled Scott. through your budget. The waste and rorts, billions of dollars, the pork barrelling, the buying of seats, the buying Order. of votes. That's part of our plan as we, re, as we reorganise and reprioritise the budget. But we have concrete plans, childcare, cheaper medicines, cheaper and cleaner energy. We've got plans to grow wages. You get that? Grow wages, not hold wages back, which is what you did. Grow wages. Invest in skills. Make sure that our people are ready for the Order. jobs of the future. These Senator are Rennick. what uh, responsible governments should be doing for the Senator past Hughes. 10 years and what uh, we're going to do now. Your time has expired, Minister. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Youth, Senator Watt. Tuesday night on the 7.30 program, the Prime Minister said, we intend to honour our promises. The Prime Minister promised on 3 December last year that Labor's policy quote, will see electricity prices fall from the current level of $275 for households by 2025. End quote. Minister, with young Australians impacted by cost of living pressures, will the government honour this promise? Great question. Minister Watt. Yes. President, I do question whether that's an appropriate question for me. Order. No, no. Order. Order. Please resume your seat, Minister. Order. Order. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, if I make, I, I do build a point of order um, in terms of the addressing of the question to a minister. I, I understand that the opposition used the word youth. Uh, the policy, uh, which was referred to in the question, is not within Minister Watt's portfolio. Uh, it's in within, within uh, Minister Bowen's portfolio, and that would be the appropriate um, uh, minister. Who's the minister representing that? It's me, I think. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Senator Wong, Senator Birmingham, are you on a point of order? I, I, I am president. Very, very briefly, mindful of Senator McKim's observation, uh, the question didn't reference a specific policy. The question referenced the promises uh, of the now government and the now prime minister, uh, and it referenced those promises in the context of cost of living pressures specific to young Australians. Senator Watt represents the minister for youth in this place, and therefore should answer questions relevant to young Australians. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'll just confirm. Um, I, I think Senator Watt is comfortable to take the question. Um, the, shall I? Minister Watt, I'm going to ask Senator Wong to confirm that who the repping minister for youth is. Senator Minister Wong, I, I'm just wishing to ascertain that the. The repping minister for this question is um, Minister Watt. If the minister wishes to, I was actually trying to be helpful to the opposition. Uh, to, I know, believe it or not, to say I'm Order. very happy for them to. I'm Order. very happy. I'm very happy. If I could finish my sentence. Oh. No, I was just going to say, if you want to re-address the question to the appropriate minister, I will take the question. If you wish to persist with it to Minister Watt, it's a matter for him to answer. I think at this point there's been no redirection from Senator Chandler, so I um, invite Minister Watt to respond to the question. Thank you, President. Um, I'm always happy to talk about our plan to bring down energy prices and your utter failure to do so in the 10 years that you were in government. Unlike, unlike the opposition, the government has a plan. It's probably one of the reasons we won the election, is that we actually had a plan going forward to bring down power prices uh, in the way that we promised. The best thing about that is that at the same time, not only will our plan bring down power prices, something that you were incapable of doing over 10 years, we will also bring down emissions, something that you didn't believe in doing for 10 years, let alone achieve, and we will create over uh, 500 or 600,000 of jobs. There's so many, I can't remember the Order. exact figure. That's how Order. many jobs we will intend to create, including five out of six in regional Australia. Our plan will help young people Senator with their power McGrath. prices. 
our plan to lift wages will help young people, especially because of the number of young workers who work in industries like hospitality, retail, minimum wage jobs. And what did those people get from a Labor government? They got a government that supported a wage rise, something that you weren't prepared to do for the 10 years that you were in government. So our policies will bring down uh, youth, wage, youth uh, prices, uh, Senator, something you couldn't do. Senator Minister, resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, uh, point of order on the uh, on question of direct relevance, and indeed in the previous point of order I commented on, I highlighted the fact that the question did not ask specifically about a policy of the government. It asked about a promise made by the now Prime Minister. That promise was that Labor's policy will see electricity prices fall from the current level by $275 for you, households by 2025. Senator Birmingham, what's the, the question, point of order? The question is, is the government going to honour that promise? That Thank you. Promise? Uh, and Thank Senator, you, Senator Watt Birmingham. is not addressing Please resume that your precise seat. promise. Thank, Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong? Uh, well, on the point of order, this is precisely why the opposition should have readdressed the question. He's, he's responding. No, no, no. Order. He, he's Senator not the Cash. minister representing the minister responsible for the policy position. On the point of order raised by Senator Birmingham, I noted that order. The Leader of the Opposition has raised a point of order on the question which I am seeking to respond to. So on the point of order, I, uh, the Minister is being relevant. It talked about electricity, it talked about promises, it talked about uh, bringing prices down and young people. Um, and in my view, the Minister has been uh, relevant. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. We have every intention of delivering all of our election commitments, whether it be this one or any other commitment that we made, such as getting rid of the ABCC, such as establishing an anti-corruption commission, something you didn't do for, three, for the last three years, uh, such as lifting minimum wages, something that has already happened under this government, and, as I say, benefits younger people as well. Now, I might just note that uh, not only did the former government fail to do anything about power prices in the 10 years that it was in government, it had the hide in the run-up to an election Order. to actually hide Order. from the Australian public how much those power prices were rising. Because this mob over here will be the people who will be Senator always remembered McGrath. for hiding the increase in the default market offer price, which has increased power prices in New South Wales alone uh, by up Minister to 19 Watt, percent. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, with cost of living pressures faced by young Australians travelling to work and study, will the government extend the reduction in the fuel excise? Uh, fuel, would government extend fuel excise? Impossible to hear that question. Uh, Senator Watt, be... direct it to me. If you sorry, require the sorry. question to be repeated, then simply ask me. President, would you mind having the question repeated? It was impossible Thank to hear you. due to the interjections. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam President. I can oblige. Minister, with cost of living pressures faced by young Australians travelling to work and study, will the government extend the reduction in the fuel excise? Senator Wong, is there a point of order? Of order. Wrong, Minister, and not a supplementary question. Uh, Senator Bir Birmingham, and then I'll come to you, Senator oh. McKim. E e e e e e equally briefly. The question relates to young Australians, to the Minister representing the Minister for Youth. The question relates to cost of living pressures, as did the primary question. Uh, I'm, taking a point of, I'm going to respond to that point of order. As I said, there's, there's already a... Just resume your seat, Minister. Order. There is a question before the Chair on uh, supplementaries. In the same way that I've agreed to look at that previous question, then we will look at this question um, and whether it relates to the primary question. And if it doesn't, we'll report back to the Senate. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing. Well, so, the... Sorry, Senator McKim, I, I beg your pardon. I thought you were on a point of order. Oh, no, I'm trying to ask a question. Right. We'll get to you. <laughs> thank you. Resume your seat. Thank you. Uh, Senator McKim, resume your seat. Thank you. Senator McKim, resume your seat. Yeah. 
So, Richard, what? I advise the Senate that the question asked by Senator Chandler has been directed to uh, Minister Watt and he can only answer it within the broad depth of his policy area. And I've, I think he had some time left, but I'm, I will check. Yeah, Senator Watt. Uh, well, unlike the opposition, uh, this government cares about young people. Uh, but as to the specifics of this question, I refer them to the responsible minister. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath. Senator Chandler is entitled to have silence while she asks her question. Senator Chandler, second supplementary. Thank Order. you. Thank you, Madam President. Mm. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Chandler, please continue. Thank you, Madam President. The ABS confirmed yesterday that inflation has risen to 6.1 per cent, the highest level in 20 years. When can young Australians expect the government to provide specific detail in measures to help them with cost of living pressures? Good. Minister Watt. I, with, with the greatest respect, I think that is a question that's appropriately directed to the, youth, the uh, minister representing the Minister for Youth, which is why I'm happy to give you an answer. Um, again, Unlike uh, the opposition, Senator McGrath, this take a breath, please. He's a Minister sore loser. Unlike the opposition, this government does care about young people. It has a minister in place with programs for young people. And the, the best thing that we have already done in the short time that we have been in power for young people is ensure that they got an increase to the minimum Senator wage. McGrath. Uh, because of the sheer number of young workers who are on the minimum wage, something that this the opposition consistently refused to do. Remember, remember about low wages were a deliberate design feature of the Australian economy under this mob? No wonder they lost the election and no wonder Order. young voters Order. refused to vote Senator for them in McKenzie. droves. So the two Senator ways that you can McGrath. deal with cost of living are bringing down costs, and that's what we fully intend to do Senator with the promises McGrath. that we put in place. The second way you can do it is by lifting wages, and everyone knows that will only happen under a Labor government. It will never happen under you, Mob. Thank you, um, Minister Watt. The time has expired. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. We'll, uh, we'll try again and finally. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, congratulations on your ministerial appointments. Two weeks ago, the Australia Institute released research which showed that rising profits, not rising wages, are a primary driver of inflation in Australia. And earlier this week, former ACCC chair Mr Rod Sims observed that in times of high inflation, companies in concentrated markets, which many Australian markets are, can use their market power to increase prices at a higher rate then their costs are increasing and further exacerbate inflation. Does your government accept that corporate profiteering is a primary driver of inflation in Australia? And if so, what are you going to do about it? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank Senator McKim for the question. Uh, there's no doubt that inflation is the most significant economic challenge or rising inflation uh, that Australians are facing across uh, the economy. In terms of the drivers of that, I mean, I think we saw in, in yesterday's um, inflation figures from the APS, the main drivers beh behind that were um, dwelling costs and uh, rising fuel costs were the major contributors to that. We have uh, been very clear about our response to that. I mean, there are some things that we can do. Some of it is out of our control in relation to some of the, the international uh, pressures that are coming from China, uh, from the war in Ukraine, or China's COVID strategy and the war in Ukraine. They are definitely having impacts here locally. Domestically, where there are floods and, and some of those natural disasters that we've seen, some of the supply chain disruptions that we've seen, which are flowing on to higher costs for households. And the position that we have taken is that in order to respond to those, we need to assist households with long term policy responses which support lowering costs, so power, uh, prices, uh, childcare, 
investing in skills, getting wages moving. They're the things that this government wants to do to deal with some of the reality of households dealing with uh, rising costs and rising interest rates, which are hitting households so hard. That's the focus of Dr Chalmers and I as we work together uh, to put forward um, our budget in October, but also over the longer term how we deal with some of the, the higher inflation and higher than expected inflationary impacts that we're seeing across the economy. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator McKim, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Uh, Minister, the Treasurer has just told Australians that because the inflation is rising, they should brace for higher unemployment and further real wage cuts. But the Treasurer said nothing about what corporations who are earning record profits should brace for. Why is your government telling those who can least afford it to brace for yet more pain, yet we're hearing nothing at all from the Treasurer about what the profiteering corporations should brace for? Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Speaker. Well, I think uh, what you saw from the ministerial statement is a very honest assessment from the Treasurer about uh, what households are experiencing now and what they can expect in the future. And this has been part of the, um, the I guess, the different approach that we are taking to those of the previous government, where it was all about spin, short-term solutions and political fixes. I mean, we, the assessment today in the ministerial statement, and it will be followed up in the October budget, is uh, giving people the best and latest information available to the government about what we expect to happen over the next year updated, of course, in October. Uh, and I would say in relation, you know, I think the government is going, I understand the point that Senator McKim is making, but the, the, the approach this government is taking is about pulling people together, working with each other to secure, uh, to deal with some of the challenges. It's no longer this divisive game that's been played in Thank politics you, about Gallagher. those that Your have and those that have expired. not. Senator McKim, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, given corporate profits are at record highs, why has your government ruled out introducing a corporate super profits tax or taxes which could fund cost of living relief by providing high quality free public services to Australians such as free childcare, truly free public education and putting dental into Medicare and helping Australians address the cost of living crisis. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, the government's position is that we will work with the private sector, with business, with community groups, uh, right across the board. We don't want to divide. We don't want to point the finger between the haves and the have-nots and, and, and point the blame at anyone. We are dealing with significant economic challenges right now. Households are feeling it. There is no, no such thing as free money, uh, Senator McKim. There is no such thing as free money going anywhere. That You can just do this and it will be just that. It doesn't work. We, will be we are dealing with these economic challenges that are thrown at us. We, will be, we are, in a, the first instance, looking, as households are trying to find extra dollars, we are also looking across our budget at ways we can reprioritise and reinvest to deal with some of these cost of living pressures. But we're going to be honest about it. We're going to work across the community and business to make sure that we get these decisions right. And Thank we're going to do Senator what we Gallagher. said we were Your going to do before the election. Expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. And it gives me great pleasure to ask a question to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Minister, the emergence and rapid spread of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia has heightened public and industry interest. FMD is a potentially devastating threat to our economy and our industry and would cost billions of dollars. Can the minister please outline to the Senate the biosecurity measures that have been strengthened and introduced in Australia by you and the Albanese government to protect Australia from an outbreak of foot and mouth disease? Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Uh, I know that agriculture in general, and particularly this outbreak, is something of great concern to you, uh, so I appreciate you asking a question uh, for the facts of the situation. Uh, the Albanese government is taking the threat of foot and mouth disease very seriously, and that is why we have introduced the toughest biosecurity measures that have ever been used in Australia based on expert biosecurity advice. 
I am pleased to say that as a result of these measures, Australia remains foot and mouth disease free. You might not know that based on what you're hearing from the opposition, but we remain foot and mouth disease free. And long may it stay that way, because an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Australia would have a devastating impact on our economy and on the livelihoods of thousands of Australians. In direct response to the spread of foot and mouth disease to Indonesia, and in particular to Bali, we have strengthened biosecurity measures beyond those that were in place under the former government to protect Australia from an, a foot and mouth disease incursion. These include, for the first time ever, wide-scale deployment of sanitation foot mats in every international airport in Australia. For the first time ever, the declaration of biosecurity response zones in all Australian international airports. And these things have Senator never been McGrath. done by any Australian government, despite the fact that we currently have 70 foot and mouth disease outbreaks around the world. There are so many measures that I don't have time to go through them, uh, but that is just a start on the types of Senator things that McKenzie. we are doing, in addition to Senator risk profiling 100 per cent of passengers returning from Indonesia and screening all mail and freight items coming from Indonesia and China. So it's no surprise, President, uh, that those strong measures have been backed in so strongly uh, by the livestock industry. For instance, Jason Strong from Meat and Livestock Australia says the federal government's response to date has been very coordinated and collaborative. Patrick Hutchinson from the Australian Meat Industry Council has said AMIC is very supportive of the Australian government's measured response. Fiona Simpson from the NFS has said the same thing. There are innumerable Thank you, comments Senator from White, industry. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone, First supplementary. Thank you very much, President. I really thank the Minister for that comprehensive and detailed uh, answer to my question. My um, Order. first supplementary. In addition to the recent outbreak in Indonesia, as you've also mentioned in your previous answer, Minister, can you please confirm, uh, not just over the 70 countries around the world, but what assistance have you and this government provided to our friends and neighbours in Indonesia to assist them to manage the outbreak? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Uh, foot and mouth disease obviously is heavily impacting Indonesia right now and its economy. And again, I might say that it was impacting Indonesia prior to the election of this government and prior to the introduction of the measures that we have put in place. With our assistance, with this government's assistance, Indonesian authorities are doing many things to get the outbreak under control. And on 15th of July, I announced a $14 million biosecurity package to bolster Australia's frontline defence and provide more technical support for countries currently battling foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. Of course, that followed the visit that I undertook to Indonesia to meet with Indonesian ministers about how we could assist. Now again, it's no wonder then that so many industry representatives have praised the government for what we've done. And it's no wonder that so many industry representatives have criticised commentary about this issue which has been more political than anything else. Ian McColl from the New South Wales Farmers Association says, I see some people out Senator there using McGrath. this outbreak as a weapon to further their own ends. And frankly, it's pretty disappointing. I wonder who he could be Thank talking you, about. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. Thank you, President. And it's very clear that uh, foot and mouth disease, along with other pests and diseases, poses as a major risk to Australian agriculture. So my last question to the minister today is, could you please outline to the Senate how the government's response to biosecurity threats differs from that from the previous government. Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr. Senator Cheney. Very, very good question. Uh, the coalition are full of ideas now that they're in opposition, but when they were in power, they didn't implement any of the measures that we have put in place, despite the fact that this outbreak got to Indonesia on their watch. This government has done more on biosecurity in nine weeks than that lot did in nine years. Everyone from the National Farmers Federation order, to the Northern Ter order. Territory Cattlemen's Association and Ag Force in Queensland are supporting the government and criticising the opposition. As I say, Senator Mr McColl McGrath. had more to say. He said, Mr McColl from the New South Wales Farmers Association, farmers have argued for stronger, sustainably funded biosecurity system for years. For years. This isn't something that's just happened overnight. Fanning the flames of fear will not help one little bit. Who could be fanning the flames? Order. I wonder who could be doing that. Order. Oh, Deirdre Chambers, she's over there, he's over there. Every single person on the opposition benches is fanning the flames of concern, is letting down farmers and is endangering Thank our international you, Minister, trade. Your time has expired. Uh, order, Senators. I'm waiting to call Senator Lambie. Senator Lambie. 
Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, my question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Um, I'm just going to be really sensitive here. It is about domestic violence. My heart goes out to you people. But there will be questions that we need to ask to make sure that we can get these policy settings correct. Senator, respectfully, I want to know how your government's proposal to introduce 10 days domestic violence leave will work in practice. So my first question is this. Will employees have to tell their bosses that they are a victim of domestic violence in order to claim domestic violence leave? Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Lambie, for a really important question. Uh, I, I do realise that this is a very sensitive issue that, uh, frankly, affects many people in this chamber, let alone the wider community. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that our government is introducing legislation to provide domestic and family violence leave for the first time in this country. It's something that many people have needed for a long time, and I'm proud uh, that we have introduced that legislation, and I look forward to wide support of that legislation. As you would understand, I'm not the responsible minister, I am the representing minister, and I'm very happy to obtain specific answers to your questions. They're very uh, valuable and worthwhile questions, and I don't want to give you the wrong information, uh, but I'm, I'll provide that you with that information as soon as I possibly can. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Madam President. Um, minister, it's common for employers to ask their, their workers to show a medical certificate for their sick leave. What evidence will employees have to give their employer to claim domestic violence leave? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, and again, thank you, Senator Lambie. Again, I will have to uh, come back to you with specific answers on those questions, not being the responsible minister. Uh, but I can assure you that this government does take the privacy uh, and, uh, of uh, victims of domestic violence very seriously. Uh, uh, I'm sure that Minister Burke, who's responsible for this legislation, has contemplated these issues uh, and, and is working with stakeholders around them. I'll certainly encourage him to continue doing so. Uh, but again, if you wouldn't mind if I could come back with some specific answers to those questions for you. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. And lastly, will employees have to work in their job for a certain period of time before they can get access to that leave? And if so, how long? Senator Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Again, I'll need to take the detail of those questions on notice and come back to you as quickly as I can. Uh, if there's anything I can do as the repping minister to facilitate some further discussion with you and your team, I'd be more than happy to do so. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Nampajimpa Rice, I believe this is your first question. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister, representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. The sites of the current CDC income support programs were put in place at the request of the communities in which they operate. Can the Minister advise which of these communities and their community leaders were consulted by the Minister prior to the Labor, <coughs> excuse me, Labor Party making the decision to scrap the cashless debit card, and which of these leaders and communities supported that decision? Thank you, Senator Nampajimpa Price. Uh, Minister Farrell. Um, oh. I, thank, um, I thank the uh, Senator for her uh, question and uh, note that it is her first question and uh, uh, good luck uh, for your time here in the Senate. Um, the, uh, the, uh, this has been an uh, issue that the government uh, has been uh, dealing with. Um, um, in particular, the uh, Minister for Social Securities, um, Amanda R Rishworth. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, legislation was introduced into the um, Parliament, the uh, lower house, uh, earlier this week um, to end the process of the cashless uh, debit card. Um, the... Well, I'll, I'll take I'll take that I'll, I'll take I'll take that uh, interjection, uh, Senator Lambie, because uh, I am aware that the uh, minister did in fact um, consult very widely um, to all of the communities. Order. Well, I'm trying to answer. You, you've Order. interjected, uh, Senator Lambie, and I'm trying to answer the question as you've uh, as you've interjected. Um, I'm personally aware of a number of visits that uh, 
um, Minister Rishworth uh, took to these communities. I can personally tell you that in South Australia, uh, Madam Deputy uh, President, um, she, uh, Madam, Madam, uh, Madam President, yes, <laughs> change there, um, that uh, Minister Rishworth visited um, uh, Sejuna in South Australia. I'm aware, and she talked to the community um, um, there Minister about these Farrell, issues. Minister please resume your seat. Sorry. Senator Rustin. Um, uh, Madam President, uh, on a point of order in relation to relevance, um, uh, the question was very specific mm. about um, the consultations that had taken place before the decision that was made, and uh, I would ask the senator to make sure that when he is responding to that question that he doesn't mislead the Senate, because I believe he may be referring to consultations or engagements that occurred after the decision Thank was made. Thank you, Senator Rustin. I'll remind um, Minister Farrell of the question, and uh, Senator Nampajimpa Rice Price, beg your pardon, asked um, which communities uh, requested coming off the CDC and which communities were consulted. Thank you, um, Minister Farrell. Well, look, I'm, I want to be clear that uh, those um, uh, discussions that took place did take place uh, after the, uh, the election, but they took Thank place— Thank you, Senator Farrell. Uh, Minister Farrell, the time has expired. Senator Nampajimpa Price, uh, first supplementary. Will the government guarantee that the rates of crime, including domestic violence, child neglect and alcohol and drug fueled violence will not increase after the removal of this important social support program. Thank you, Senator Nampajim Price. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank the Senator for uh, her question. Um, look, there obviously um, are serious issues in a range of uh, communities uh, in, this, uh, in this country. Um, but what we know from the uh, evidence of the 17,000 or so people who were on the cashless uh, debit card was that it wasn't solving the problems that it was alleged. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. It, it wasn't solving. It wasn't solving. It wasn't solving that the problems. It wasn't solving. It wasn't solving the problems that. Uh, it was alleged to be fixed by this cashless debit card. Now, Labor could not have been clearer. The Labor Party, the Labor Party uh, Senator, could not have been clearer about what its policy was in the lead up to the last election. We made Senate, uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham. President, point of order on direct relevance. The question wasn't asking what the government's policy was prior to the election. The question was specific about the consequences of the legislation the government has uh, introduced for the abolition of the cashless debit card, uh, and specifically asking the minister whether or not the government can give a guarantee that the rates of crime, domestic violence, child neglect, etc., will not increase. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. As you are aware, I can't direct a minister to answer a question, and certainly. Uh, Minister Farrell did talk about um, the evidence of proof and so on, so he was, in my view, being relevant to the question, and I would ask Minister Farrell to continue. Thank you, um, um, Madam President. Um, look, the reality is that there was no evidence whatsoever that the cashless debit card Thank was you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Nampajimpa Price, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Is the government intending to remove compulsory income management from the Northern Territory? Thank you, Senator Nampajimpa Price. Um, Minister Farrell. No. Thank you, um, Minister Farrell. You've completed your answer. Um, Senator Babette. I believe this is also your first question. Congratulations. Yes, it is. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on what the government is going to do to reduce the $963 billion of national debt? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam President. And I thank Senator Babbitt for the question and for his first question in this place. Uh, the senator is right to point out that we face a significant challenge managing the 
the uh, almost a trillion dollars, it'll hit a trillion dollars next financial year of Liberal debt that has been uh, left for this government to manage. Uh, well, it is, it is true. It is true. A trillion dollars, a trillion dollars of Liberal debt. Order. Trillion dollars of Liberal debt that that is left on the budget to manage debt, debt going out into the future. And whilst those opposite would like to say, would like to say that this is all a result of the pandemic. Senator Ayres. The, the, the former government had doubled the debt before the pandemic hit. Let's not forget that. Their fiscal vandals had done the damage before the pandemic hit, and now we are all going to be paying the price for it. And the cost of servicing that debt is increasing and increasing rapidly. At, and we've seen the latest figures from the Treasurer that some of that cost of servicing debt is going to exceed programs paid for that pay currently on childcare subsidy, higher education, those types of um, programs run by the Commonwealth Government, the cost of servicing debt is going to exceed those. That's the situation we're in, and that's why the work we're doing, uh, Senator Babbitt, through uh, uh, going through the budget line by line to see where sensible savings can be made so that we can reduce uh, that debt over time. It is one of the key challenges facing us as we work through the Expenditure Review Committee to make sure that we can deal with some of those challenges uh, over time. And servicing debt and managing the debt is a really important part of strong, Thank responsible you, budget Gallagher. management. Minister Gallagher, Senator Babbitt, second, uh, first supplementary, sorry. Thank you, President. Inflation has just risen to a horrifying figure of 6.1 per cent, absolutely huge. Now, the cost of electricity is a component of CPI. What is the government's plan to reduce the cost of electricity? Senator Gall Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank the senator for the question. The, uh, the Labor government went to the last election with a plan uh, known as Powering Australia Plan that involved setting up a Rewiring Australia, which is a, a, a fun. Well, it, we have to modernise the grid. I won't interject to Senator Rennick, but. In case he hasn't noticed, we need to work out how to get more renewables into the grid so that we can lower power prices, something that you guys failed to do Order. over years Senator and years. Hughes. We need to grab the opportunities that come, the Senator opportunities Brown. that are going to come with modernising the electricity grid so that it can take in more renewables good for lowering our emissions and lowering power Senator prices. Hughes. The cheapest price, the cheapest energy is renewable energy and we can't get it into the grid. We can't get it into the grid because you guys did nothing. So that is what we'll do. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Order. Order. These are Senator Babette, Senator Brown. I'll call all senators to order. This is Senator Babette's first set of questions. He has the right to ask them in silence and hear the answers in silence. Second supplementary, Senator Babette. The RBA has increased the cash rate, which has triggered an increase in home loan rates. What is the government's plan to help the millions of Australians who will experience hardship as a result of not being able to meet their ever-increasing mortgage repayments? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, and I thank the Senator for the question. And it's an important question because it's about how households manage with increasing costs, not just from mortgages, but from uh, sh you know going to the shops, filling their car up. The, you know the prices of everything are, is going up. Uh, the areas that we think we can make the most difference as a government, obviously, there's the short-term. Um, additional payments that were made through the former government's budget, which are still going through the system. But where we believe that the most responsible investments can be made to support households so that they can manage some of these costs are by trying to lower power, lower power prices, lower childcare costs, getting wages moving and dealing with some of the supply chain blockages and disruption that we've seen. That's actually the areas where we as a government can make a difference. I think everybody understands the challenges that people are facing and that they can't be fixed overnight, but we're a responsible government that's going to make those investments to help over the longer term. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Marielle Smith. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Senator Farrell. 
Australian exporters are struggling with the combined impact of 10 years of neglect on the world stage and the additional challenges of the pandemic. Can the minister advise how the newly announced Export Supply Chain Service will help our Australian food and beverage exporters navigate some of these challenges? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator Smith uh, for that uh, question. One of the very Senator many uh, good young women on this side of the uh, chamber. Um, there's no doubt, uh, <coughs> President, that. Uh, some Australian exporters have done it really tough as a result of the neglect by the previous uh, government, the worsening conditions during the pandemic, as well as Russia's uh, terrible war on the Ukraine. Exporters are critical to our economy and they deserve a government who will stand with them and ensure that they uh, uh, get the support they need to thrive. To this end, last week in Brisbane, I announced the establishment of a new service to help Australian food and beverage exporters navigate global supply chains. One of the biggest ongoing challenges for Australian exporters is getting their produce into international customers. Over the past few years, the freight environment has irreversibly changed. There's no doubt that the supply chains we see today are very different from the supply chains that we saw prior to the pandemic. To help these exporters navigate these complexities, the Australian Government has established the Export Supply Chain Service. Under this new service, Australian exporters, states, territory governments, uh, industry bodies will have ex access to information and insights on supply chain issues. It will be, uh, it'll give uh, Australian uh, exporters, uh, Madam uh, President, the information and the uh, uh, insights uh, that they need to inform their decision-making and navigate what has become very complex uh, uh, supply chain issues. Throughout the pandemic, many Australian businesses have demonstrated ingenuity and grit in response to ongoing trade disruptions. With the aid of the Australian uh, Government, they'll continue Farrell, to do so. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Mariel Smith, first supplementary. As we work to restore our international reputation, what is the minister hearing from Australian exporters and businesses about how the new service will support their recovery? Thank you, Senator Smith. Um, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Smith, for that uh, question. And, uh, Madam uh, President, um, I was fortunate. <coughs> sorry, um, I was fortunate enough uh, last week to uh, attend uh, the Brisbane uh, markets and uh, yeah yeah lovely <coughs> lovely set of markets Absolutely. and uh, visit a company called JH Levy uh, this is this is a company that uh, uh, exports a whole range of uh, produce uh, overseas in fact <coughs> you'd like to know this senator Birmingham I in fact saw them exporting some naval oranges from Wakery uh, into the uh, the China yep yeah, yep yeah. Senator Rustin Sen Senator Rustin approves. Um, this, 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 little company, this little company working out of the Brisbane uh, markets exports all over the world and like all of the other companies that export this, uh, uh, these uh, great Australian products, uh, they have been suffering through this, uh, through this pandemic. Um, Thank uh, you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Please resume your seat. Second supplementary, Senator Mario Smith. Yes. Order. Senator Smith. Can the minister advise what other actions the Albanese government is taking to facilitate and support trade opportunities for Australian businesses after a decade of inaction? Minister Farrell. Uh, thanks, Senator, uh, Senator Smith, uh, for her question. And uh, again, congratulate her for taking an interest in uh, trade, which the opposite side don't seem to be at all uh, interested in. But, <clears throat> The Albanese government is uh, um, supporting Australian businesses because, because, well, let's talk about wine exports. Uh, you completely, Order. you completely Order. let down every Order. single exporter of wine in this country. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. And one Order. of the reasons, one Excuse of the reasons me. you lost this last election because you didn't understand what you were doing to Australian exporters in meat, Order. in crayfish, in wine, in barley. None of those, none of those, none of those industries got any support from this government. But we are, we are committed 
we are committed to repairing the damage that you did to this country, to those exporters, and we're going Thank to you, do Senator it. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Order, Minister Wong. I'd like to move an extension, but I, instead I will say, <laughs> instead I will say, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Uh, President, uh, just on the review of questions that, uh, that you undertook uh, earlier, um, and noting that uh, that was first raised in relation to questions to Senator Watt from Senator McKenzie regarding mm -hmm. foot and mouth disease, and that those questions went through related issues of foot mats, of uh, vaccines, and of biosecurity officers. Uh, in undertaking that review, I would encourage you, whilst noting I believe these questions are all in order, to equally look at the question from Senator Ciccone um, on the same topic of foot and mouth disease uh, that went through uh, domestic measures and then separately asked about assistance to Indonesia and then separately asked about the actions of the previous government. Uh, and I think you will find there's a consistency there. I would contend, President, that they are all in order. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. We will take particular notice. Yes. Yeah. Um. Just so call him. Senator Watt, do you seek the call? Thank you, Deputy President. I advise the Chamber that I have additional information to provide in response to questions I took on notice during question time yesterday. And as is the custom, I seek leave of the Chamber to provide those answers. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Deputy President. In response to the question I took on notice from Senator McGrath, as I advised the Chamber yesterday, on the week commencing the 11th of July, 23,600 passengers arrived from Indonesia by air, with 90 per cent of those travellers uh, coming in from Bali. In answer to the question I took on notice from Senator Birmingham, I advise as follows. On the 15th of July, as part of the government's $14 million funding package to strengthen Australia's prevention and preparedness for foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease, we announced 18 new biosecurity officers would be employed at our mail centres and our airports. The increase in biosecurity officers has been added to an already running biosecurity officer recruitment program, and this program will be finalised by the end of September 2022. Officers will then be trained and deployed to Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth, Darwin, Cairns and Adelaide. In the meantime, my department is bringing on an additional 65 contractors and 10 team leaders to assist with biosecurity efforts at our international airports and mail centres. New contractors began in both Sydney and Melbourne on Monday. In answer to the question I took on notice from Senator Roberts, the, number of the exact number of doses held in the vaccine bank uh, is considered confidential information in the interest of national security, including to protect against bioterrorism threats. Uh, we hold enough vaccine doses, I am advised, to cover at least the first four months of a disease response, which then provides time to order more vaccines should they be required. The vaccine manufacturer prioritises the production of vaccines for countries that are experiencing a disease outbreak, hence uh, the priority being given to Indonesia uh, at the moment. In, finally, in answer to the question I took on notice from Senator Cash, uh, stakeholders were consulted about the government's plan to abolish the ABCC on the following dates since the election. On the 17th of June this year, uh, a, me a meeting was held with the CFMEU Construction Division. On the 21st of June this year, a Zoom, was held, a Zoom meeting was held with the AWU National Executive. On the 29th of June, a meeting was held with the ACTU. On the 5th of July, a meeting was held of Commonwealth, State and Territory Ministers with Responsibility for Workplace Relations. On the 19th of July, a meeting was held of the National Workplace Relations Consultative Council at Parliament House. I am advised that at this meeting, the Minister informed stakeholders that, quote, the building code will be amended to ensure that workers in building and construction are subject to the same rules to those in other industries. Council members include representatives from the Housing Industry Association, uh, Ms Melissa Adler, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, Scott Barklam and Andrew McKellar, the ACTU, Sally McManus, Michelle O'Neill, Scott Connolly and Liam O'Brien, the Business Council of Australia, Ben Davies, the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association, Gerard Dwyer, the Australian Resources and Energy em Employer Association, Steve Knott, the National Farmers Federation, Ben Rogers, the United Workers Union, Joanne Schofield, the Master Builders Australia, Danita Wan, and the Australian Industry Group, Stephen Smith. 
Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Rennick. To take note of answers provided by Senator Watt. Well, today was a masterclass by a minister who has clearly still got his training wheels on. This is a minister who is way out of his depth. And I've got a lot of experience with this man for the last three years. For the last three years, whenever we've done interviews together, this guy has done nothing but throw smear and mud. He hasn't been able to answer any questions. We've just got a long list of answers then from the questions that he took on notice from yesterday, because he is not around the detail. He is not around the detail. He doesn't take the livestock industry seriously in this country, and it's not surprising. He grew up in inner city Brisbane. He went to an inner city posh school. He's never gone any further west than the Oxley pub. He knows nothing about agriculture in this country. And let me tell you, the livestock industry in this country is the backbone of this country. It's not just beef, it's sheep and it's pigs, it's cattle uh, and camels and, all, and also all the wild feral animals. So if this gets out, if foot and mouth gets out, we've got a, a, a wild pigs roaming around out, out in the regions. This will be very hard to contain. And of course, what Senator Watt doesn't realise is he likes to blame the previous government for not doing anything, was that foot and mouth only got into Indonesia on the 9th of May. But the key part of it was, was that it only got into Bali on the 5th of July. So that was when Labor took government, uh, after Labor took government. Now, that is a classic example of the spin by Senator Watt. Now, as he just pointed out, 90 per cent of the traffic that comes from Indonesia is from Bali. Right? So that is why the previous government didn't do anything, right? Or in terms of didn't have to do anything because there was no serious outbreak until it gets to Bali. But when you've got travellers going over to Bali, coming back, and 90 per cent of the people coming back are basically not thinking of foot and mouth. You don't expect to when you go to Bali. That's not the first thing on your mind. Senator Watt tries to downplay just how serious this issue is. And let me tell you this, that if foot and mouth gets into this country, it will be very serious. Every farm within a three kilometre radius of where foot and mouth outbreak is diagnosed will have to have all of their livestock destroyed on the spot. That will absolutely harm, if the, and, and if that continues, we will see a devastation of our livestock. Now, that is not a laughing matter, and that is something that Senator Watt should be taking more seriously. And we know that he's not because his good colleague here, Senator Ayres, pointed out that they took a long time to even have any foot mats. They didn't have any foot mats. So he's taken a long time to respond. He's only bringing on 18, 18 extra biosecurity staff. That is not enough when you've got 90 per cent of 323,000, about 300,000 people coming from Bali. How on earth is 18 extra uh, security uh, officers? going to actually make sure that we trap foot and mouth in this country. And the other thing that I want to talk about is the, is the fact that the Labor Party think they are going to look after our youth. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Labor Party have a long history of destroying the dreams and aspirations of our young people. And there's no greater example of that than the introduction of superannuation in this country. Right now, our young children who are on low incomes, having 10 per cent of their incomes taken from them. It's now just jumped to 10.5 per cent in the last week, in the last month, and Labor want to take it to 12 per cent. But that's not enough, because in the second term, if they get in, they're already talking about lifting it to 15 per cent. Now, I fail to see how that's going to help our young people deal with the cost of living when they are ripping money out of, our young, out of young people's pockets and giving it to their mates and the industry super funds and their rivers of gold and their rivers of gold. And this is why they won't do anything about the corporate sector either, because the Labor Party today is the party of the big end of town. And never, ever forget that. They've marched through the bureaucracy. They've marched through the corporations. They love big business. This is the party of big business. And, and they've just been ripping it, ripping the fees over $30 billion in fees out of hard-working Australians every year. And this is why they go para paralytic when you ever talk about touching superannuation. It's not your money. 
you should give that money back to the young people and let them pay off their mortgages. But you see, they don't want that because the industry funds own over 20 per cent of the banks in this country. They want to be ripping off our young people both ways, through bank fees and interest and Thank superannuation you, fees. Senator Krogan. I also rise to make a broad and wild statement about um, the questions asked today of Senator Watt. Um, it's wild ranging, yes, because having such a broad, um, such a broad remit here is, is quite good. I think um, the first thing, just to be really clear, the manner in which this debate has rolled on over the last two days there's been a, the asking of questions and no sense of wanting to hear the answers at all. So the footmats, it's very clear. They were decided upon by the minister. They were announced by the minister. They were commissioned by the minister and they were then installed. They were installed on Monday. The numbers given were appropriate numbers. And I think that the, the, the entire approach here has been Wild. I appreciate that the opposition may be suffering with quite a lot of grief at the moment, but the behaviour. Okay, that's lovely. Glad to hear it. Um, it's important. Yeah. Um, the number of people returning from Indonesia since the outbreak was answered the previous day, and the updated numbers based on following questions were also answered. If you're actually looking for a genuine investigation of what's happening with this critical issue, then you should potentially improve your questions, listen to the answers, and bring, bring further questions on from there. Senator Renning, I think, of, excuse me. Yeah, we're, not, we're not here to get lessons on how to answer, put questions to the ministers, and if you could ask her to stay pertinent to the actual relevant I, I, questions. I appreciate the point of order, but I believe Senator Krogan is relevant. There's a fair bit of latitude in this this part of the um, standing um, this part of the day. So I think if we're talking about the facts here, we have introduced the toughest biosecurity measures ever used in Australia. We have remained calm and focused on maintaining strict biosecurity quarantine protocols to keep this virus out of Australia which is what we intend to do, which is what we will do with the measures that have been put in place. We have strengthened the biosecurity measures. We have a $14 million biosecurity package. We have deployed sanitised foot mats, as we've discussed. We have additional frontline resources at the airports and in mail centres. We have enhanced the mail profiling and inspections. We have added biosecurity officers boarding planes on arrival, we have increased the information flow. Everything is being done to make sure that this issue is being managed and that we will not have an outbreak in this country. We have the support of the major stakeholders who also believe that we are dealing with this appropriately. So I don't think that there's um, room for the opposition to be looking at this situation as a joke, as a shouting match, there are facts here. The facts are fully available. We are taking appropriate action and this country will remain safe. Our relationship with our international, with our international friends and partners is something that the Labor Party has worked very hard on and has made fundamental improvements in in the last number of weeks since we took government. I would also um, range to the issue of the questions uh, from Senator Chandler around young people. Now, at the point at which, at the point at which Senator Chandler started asking her questions, and all the yelling and shouting and heckling was going on, the entire gallery was full of school students. Now. I'm pretty confident that the kind of behaviour they saw in this chamber is not the behaviour that they would be allowed to get away with at home or in the classroom. Now, heckling is something that goes on every question time, but not listening to the answers, not listening to the answers is not something that I believe we did. I will also take you to the fact that when we're talking about 
the economic future of young people and the situation they find themselves in. We have experienced a decade of energy policy paralysis. That is why we have got issues with our energy prices. We have spent a decade under the previous government with the wrong investments in skills and local manufacturing capacity. We have not boosted the jobs of the future. We have not invested in our young people. We have not provided them with appropriate training to build their careers and foster a positive future for themselves. This country, under the previous government, just totally put those young people aside and did not provide them with the opportunities that they deserve. Senator Macdonald. I rise to continue taking note of responses, uh, of questions given to uh, Minister Watt. As somebody who's been involved in the agricultural industry uh, all of my life and receive hundreds of representations from farmers and graziers across this country every week since the introduction uh, of or the discovery of foot and mouth in Bali, uh, I share uh, the industry's concern about the politicisation of this discussion. Uh, I called early for greater steps to be taken in the response, not because I was interested in a political outcome, but because I was urged by industry, by farmers, by graziers to provide a sense of urgency to both the department and the government. They were incredibly distressed about the impending risk to uh, their herd, to uh, their farmers and graziers' mental health, to the impact on consumers of the cost of food. Uh, but anyway, we all know, we all know what the impact of both foot and mouth and lumpy skin disease would be on arriving in this country. We don't need to continue that discussion because it is too horrific uh, to think about. When foot and mouth arrived in the UK in 2001, it spread the length of that country after uh, contaminated meat came in on an airline food tray that was fed to pigs. It, came, it, it travelled the length of the country within days. It was into Ireland and then spread with the export of uh, viola animals to France and to Netherlands. And this all happened within such a short time frame that the contamination and quarantine zones resulted in the destruction of six million head of sheep and cattle. The, the impact on those farmers, those butchers, those uh, transport uh, truck drivers, uh, uh, consumers, uh, still lives with them, uh, in them today, uh, in, a, in a desperation. So uh, the, the response uh, that the opposition has had has, has not been, as has been suggested, a political one, but a sheer uh, desperation of ensuring that the government is making a proportionate response to the risk. A proportionate response. And that is our job. Our job is to ensure that we represent our industries and that the response is suitable. And I have to tell you that we are now week four. Week four since the introduction of foot and mouth, or the discovery of foot and mouth in, in, in Bali. It is a completely different country because unlike other countries that you travel to, uh, there is a lot more uh, pigs, which are a super um, conductor of foot and mouth disease. It, it grows um, quickly and spreads easily amongst that herd. Uh, it is also 25% uh, of the people, the 143,000 Australians who travelled to Bali last month, 25% stay in a private residence where the uh, ladies who might be cooking for that family or that, that house return from caring for their sick animals at six o'clock in the morning and cook a, a meal for the Australian family before they get on a plane back to this country at, say, eight o'clock in the morning. So the risk profile is very different. And that is why the previous government, uh, like this government, was watching the risks as identified by the department. But we are now in a different situation. Uh, so I acknowledge the measures that have been introduced by this government, but I do have to once again point out that they have been too slow. The foot mats that are in place are citric acid. Normally, contact with citric acid to kill uh, foot and mouth disease or a virus like that would be 30 minutes. We're asking people to walk across it 
hopefully shake the dirt from their shoes and kill the virus as it falls on the mat. It doesn't address the entirety of their shoe. It doesn't address the other fo um, footwear and clothes that they have in their suitcase. We've also been asking that all food that comes into the country be dumped in big food tubs the way you do going into the Northern Territory or New Zealand, because that is a, a proportionate response to the risk to this nation. And we're also flagging that the response and the money being spent, the $14 million, the, the uh, vaccines into Indonesia, uh, into uh, Papua New Guinea, into Bali, is not enough. It is not fast enough. It is not proportionate. And that is the job we will continue to carry out. Senator Smith. Thank you. And uh, Deputy President, this is my first opportunity to congratulate you on your role. I'd like to take it. I was getting a bit worried about the lack of South Australian representation in this chamber, so it's very pleasing uh, to see you in the chair. Um, not enough South Australians uh, uh, in, in that sort of area of the chamber, I would Thank say. You. Thank um, you for your kind I was words. really, really pleased to hear the, the sudden interest from the other side today on youth policy in Australia. Um, particularly on the economic impacts of youth. And I, I do wonder if the opposition hadn't abolished the Youth Advisory Council, if perhaps they would have less questions and more answers around what young people in Australia are thinking and needing and wanting from their government. And I'm very pleased to let them know that under a federal Labor government, a thoughtful, detailed youth policy is back. We're going to have a new youth engagement model. We're going to have a fantastic minister for youth in Aan Lee. So for all those questions which went unanswered for you during opposition because you abolished the advisory board, really great news. Young people finally have a seat at the table again, just as they should. Now, Senator Farrell referred to me as a young person today, and uh, whilst I don't take any issues with that uh, at the uh, age of 35, it's nice to still be called young, uh, but, I, but, I, but I will be respectful of, uh, of those Australians who are actually um, in, the, in the government's definition of young, and I won't speak on their behalf or for them, but I will advocate for their interests, because you see, when, when, when this lot were in government, we saw... Uh, intergenerational theft of young people when they were forced to raid their superannuation accounts during the pandemic. Intergenerational theft. Targeting the people in our country with the lowest balances of superannuation, they were forced to raid that. Do you think they will ever get that back? Do you think they will ever catch up from that act of intergenerational theft? They will not. Young people in Australia are doing it really tough. And they've been saddled with the burden of a trillion dollars worth of debt from the former government. They've been saddled with a former government who had uh, low wages, stagnant wages as a design flaw of their economy, unlike the Labor government, which has already advocated to an increase in the minimum wage, which will make a real difference in young people's lives. Young people bear the burden of failures of government more than any other group in our society. They have to deal with it for the longest. And when I was elected to parliament, I made a vow to stand up for children, to stand up for young people, and that's exactly what I'm doing. And I am so proud to be part of a government with fairness at the heart of all of our plans, with concern for the next generation at the heart of all of our plans. We never stop thinking about the next generation. We never stop thinking about the next generation. We've got some great policies for them. Fee-free TAFE. What an excellent policy if you're a young person. 465,000 fee-free places, including 45,000 new places. My stepdad's a TAFE teacher. We've seen firsthand how amazing TAFE can be, how amazing TAFE can be, the opportunities it has for young people from the dedicated and passionate workforce which delivers it. For those kids who want to go to university, and look, we know university is not everything, but for some kids that's the thing which will unlock their dreams and out their potential in their future. $481.7 million to deliver 20,000 extra university places, unlike the former government which made it more expensive and more difficult for young people to go to university. If you want to hear about a positive agenda for young people. I could go on more. I'll take an extension of time. I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased you're interested. I'm really pleased you're interested. 
really, really pleased. Oh, no, no, I'm so glad you're back, Senator Reddick. It's so great to have your engagement back. I think the only time I've been named in the Senate is in response to an interjection from you before, but I promise to behave myself this time. Deputy Speaker, it's nice to have you back. I know it's been a bit tough. I know it's been a bit tough, but it's nice to have you and your interjections back. Deputy Speaker, young people can trust that our government will never forget them. We'll never forget them in, in every way we consider and design policy. We take seriously our responsibility of custodians for the next generation. Our responsibility, our heartfelt belief, which defines all of us as Labor people, to leave this nation better for the generations that come after us. That is core to every single person who sits on this side of the chamber. It is our reason for being, our reason for being Labor. We care about the next generation. We will make Australia better for them because we're in it for them and not for ourselves. But great to have you back, Senator Rennick. Senator Brockman. Sorry about that, Mr Deputy President. I was just enjoying Senator Rennick's interjections, uh, which are always disorderly, I would remind. Senator Rennick. Um, I too rise to take note on answers given by Senator Watt and uh, in beginning I will note the uh, very thoughtful contribution of Senator Macdonald. Like Senator Macdonald I do come from a farming background uh, and like Senator Macdonald I care deeply about the agricultural industries of Australia. And as Senator Macdonald said, one of the things that we are reflecting is in this place is the level of concern we are hearing from our agricultural communities uh, under threat from uh, foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease uh, and the response that is currently uh, occurring. Uh, Senator Watt was sworn in on the 1st of June from the 1st of June. Foot and mouth disease was present in Indonesia, yes, when Senator Watt was sworn in. Uh, but in July, foot and mouth disease reached Bali. A full month after Senator Watt was sworn in, arrivals from Bali to Perth in the month of July are around 17,000 people. 17,000 individual passengers returning to Perth Airport from Bali. By the evidence given and the dates publicly available as to when foot baths became available, foot cleaning became available in the airport, two days. There were two days of foot cleaning available in the airport. That means, and I'll be generous, we'll say around 1,500. At best, 2,000 passengers had access to those foot baths. So we had 17,000 passengers arriving back in Perth in the month of July. At best, around 2,000 of them having access to foot baths at a time when for probably all that time, uh, foot and mouth disease was present in Bali. Now, foot and mouth disease was only detected in Bali, I believe, on the 6th or 7th of July. However, everybody knows that the presence of foot and mouth disease will predate the actual date of declaration. So we had effectively a full month with more than a month of warning before that, a month of Senator Watt being the minister, and so around 15,000, 15,000 individual passengers returned on planes from Bali to Perth no foot baths and no increased levels of inspection. Um, now, and, and anecdotally, and I know you cannot rely on anecdotes in this place, you need hard evidence, but anecdotally I've spoken to numerous people who went through the airport from uh, returning from Bali in that period who ticked a box saying they had been to a farm, who ticked a box saying they had been to rural areas and who received no additional inspection, right. no additional inspection, no additional uh, precautions to take footwear out of bags, to examine it for dirt, to look for uh, a potential um, contaminated uh, 
products in luggage. So you have people declaring, doing the right things. Australians do care about agriculture. Australians care deeply about agriculture. And you have people doing the right thing, declaring, and then nothing happens. And then nothing happens. And the other thing that worries those on our side is when you have a state Labor Minister downplaying, downplaying the serious threat of foot and mouth disease, saying, oh, it could make milk, milk and meat cheaper. Have we heard one word out of the Federal Minister for Agriculture on that topic? Have we heard one word from Senator Watt, Minister Watt, the Minister for Agriculture, the minister who is responsible for, for protecting the agricultural industries of Australia, did he repudiate that state Labor minister? Not a word. Not a word. And yet this is the state Labor minister who he said in his own words yesterday that he is relying on to manage Thank biosecurity. You. Thank you, Senator Brockman. I'm going to put the question uh, to the motion moved by Senator Rennick. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of uh, the response to my question given by Senator Gallagher in question time. And um, I want to start by making the point that despite in all three of my questions, the primary question, the first supplementary, the second supplementary question, despite me explicitly referring to the issue of corporate profits and specifically asking about the issue of corporate profits, Senator Gallagher could not bring herself to say the words corporate profit uh, in any of her responses to my questions. Now, the facts are these. Corporate profits in Australia are at record highs. They are soaring and they have never been higher. And corporate profits are significantly contributing to inflation and they are significantly contributing, therefore, to the cost of living pressures facing ordinary Australians. Now, in the House today, the Treasurer, Dr Chalmers, gave a long speech telling Australians that they should brace for the tough times ahead. He told Australians to brace for higher unemployment. He told Australians to, ba to brace for their real wages to go backwards, or I should say to continue to go backwards. And he warned us to brace for those things because interest rates are going up. It was a speech heavy on the hand-wringing, uh, heavy on the old, we don't want to gloss over the glaring issues, shtick. And uh, heavy on the old, we can't bury the bad news shtick. Uh, it was the Treasurer doing his best ashen-faced routine. But what was most striking about his speech is what he didn't mention. And what he didn't mention is that corporate profits are soaring. Corporate profits are at record highs and a record high rate of Australia's income is being siphoned off by private capital. And not once did the Treasurer mention that these record high corporate profits are actually a primary driver of inflation in Australia. And that is a critical point and it's a point that the Treasurer didn't make today in his speech in the other place, and it's a point that the Minister for Finance, the Minister in this place representing the Treasurer, refused three times to acknowledge today. Two weeks ago, the Australia Institute released research which showed that Australia is at the beginning of a price-profit spiral. Their analysis found it is rising profits not rising costs or rising wages that are driving Australia's inflation. And the executive director of the Australia Institute, Richard Dennis, made the obvious point. And he said this, I quote, while workers are being asked to make sacrifices in the name of controlling inflation, the data makes it clear that it is, that it is the corporate sector 
that needs to tighten its belt. And earlier this week, former ACCC chair Rod Sims said that one of the ways that big corporations can help fuel inflation is, and I quote, when there's high inflation, dominant firms often realise they can increase prices above any cost prices because consumers will be more accepting of this. In other words, when inflation is running hot, Corporations with market power, which many Australian corporations have, use this as cover for profiteering. Now, this is fundamental stuff, obvious stuff. And by all accounts, next week the RBA will again increase interest rates. And this is going to hurt the most for those who live below the poverty line, as always, uh, renters, as always, and new homeowners, many of whom bought because they believed the governor of the RBA when he said rates weren't likely to move until 2024. But these people who are about to feel the pain because inflation is running hot have had little or nothing to do with causing inflation to be running hot. Instead of giving corporate Australia a free pass, the, the Treasurer should be telling corporate Australia to brace for a super profits tax. We need a super profits tax in this country to raise $460 billion in revenue so that we can do things like free childcare, put dental and mental into Medicare to address the cost of living crisis. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator McKim. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Honourable Senator.